Um, well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for attending this VIP case presentation. Um, my name is Nick. Uh, I'm a first year fellow at UCB in our global regulatory affairs department. Um, and I'm joined by Helen, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Helen Weinberg and I'm the first year regulatory affairs fellow at Vertex Pharmaceuticals in conjunction with Northeastern University. Very excited to have everyone here. Um, I did not have this presentation as a student, so very nice to get a background of what regulatory affairs is um, and hear from people who are doing it firsthand. Mm -hmm. um, so just some objectives, um, you know, obviously we're going to go over regulatory affairs in general. Um, what's going to be of particular interest is uh, the regulations that we'll go over as well as um, you know some of the global regulatory authorities i'm sure most people are familiar with the fda but clearly there's other health authorities around the world um, we're going to help identify key development milestones that warrant um, fda interaction uh, discuss the different roles and functions within regulatory and how that fits in um, with pharma in general and ideally highlight the value of a pharmacist in regulatory affairs. Um, so what exactly is regulatory affairs? Um, I know this is a little hard to pinpoint sometimes. Um, so it's, it's a relatively new profession. Um, and I, ideally, you are acting as a liaison between the pharmaceutical company and the health authority. Um, obviously, many of us have a pharmacy background, so we're always trying to think with the patient in mind, but we also need to try and protect the company. So um, ideally, you want to protect public health, and I, I like that wording. Um, you know, you're, you have your hand in uh, safety, efficacy, QMS, um, you know, many different things over the myriad of um, drug design. And um, depending on the, the type of role that you have, you can have a really big impact on providing, um, you know, some sort of strategic guidance on the, the development of a drug, operational support. Um, you can help both early and late phase, especially like with marketing commercial. So um, it's, a, it's a very interesting program. Um, clearly, there's, there's need for regulations and in many aspects but to identify a few of those um again we have the pharmacist background so patients and prescribers they need access to safe and effective medicines right we need to have some sort of control on this um, the fda puts out many regulations specifically to control how clinical trials are conducted um you know how at, at once drugs are approved even there's different like post-marketing requirements um, industry and academia must have a clear understanding of what is required. Again, that's why we kind of give these presentations. There's um, the, uh, we, we try to learn about drug development in schools, and I know that's a little different depending on what pharmacy school you went to. Uh, and ultimately, you know, um, governments have to decide how a, a drug fits into that market. Um, you know, there's a lot of countries with universal healthcare, so potentially they have to weigh benefits of one drug over the other. Um, you know, in the US, uh, a lot of times insurance companies are kind of doing that. Um, and even like on a hospital level formulary. So, um, you know, that's, these are all things that we have to think of as a whole, even as a pharmacist that's not in um, the industry, you have to consider all of these aspects. Um, there's some very common things that are regulated that pertain to regulatory affairs. Um, one of the more obvious ones is marketing authorizations. Um, Helen's probably a little bit more <laughs> familiar with this right now, but uh, essentially it's just making sure that you're um, not saying what you shouldn't and saying what's appropriate for your drug. So um, sometimes companies want to push the envelope a little bit more and, um, you know, really give access to as many patients that they feel can take their drug. Uh, and sometimes there's pushback saying, well, you know, maybe it's not appropriate that this patient population takes it or your drug doesn't actually like do what you're saying. Um, so in regulatory affairs, you're kind of acting as that liaison, just making sure that, um, you know, you're, you're, what you're saying is appropriate. Uh, but still giving access to the uh, wide variety of patients. Um, 
it, throughout clinical research, so there's, there's many different um, drug applications, for example, investigational new drug application uh, or an IND, uh, there's clinical trial applications, new drug applications, NDAs. So, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of documentation that goes into regulatory affairs, as I'm sure many of you are aware. Um, again, this is just to highlight the, the safety of trial subjects, quality of the product, um, deliver results in a consistent manner. Um, pretty standard throughout regulatory affairs in general. Advertising and promotion kind of ties into the uh, marketing authorization. So um, again, you want to make sure that things are accurate within the program. You're not saying things that you shouldn't be saying, um, as it says, in line with license information. Uh, and finally, pharmacovigilance, that's uh, an, an emerging field, especially for pharmacists. Um, there's many regulations in the US just ensuring that safety data is reported. Um, as pharmacists, there are many ways that we can do that. Um, you know, in, in pharma, if you hear about an adverse effect, you are supposed to report that. Uh, and eventually the FDA will um, analyze all of the safety reports and determine if action is needed for your drug. Um, as I mentioned, so uh, most of us are aware of the Food and Drug Administration of the FDA. That is the health authority or regulatory authority of the United States. There's many around the world. Um, some of the more frequent ones that uh, we deal with would be the European Medicine Agency or the EMA. Um, since Brexit happened, there is a new uh, United Kingdom health authority. So that is the MHRA, Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. Um, and also with Japan, they are a um, strong emerging market, and that is the Pharmaceuticals and Medical Devices Agency, or PMDA. Um, you know, just to give you guys some perspective, these are all regulatory agencies that I um, familiarized my with, my familiarized myself with uh, through this fellowship program, and I'm sure many others have as well. Um, let me just make sure we're good on time. Okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, do you want to take over the next couple right. slides? <laughs> yes, yeah, sounds good. Um, so, um, like Nick mentioned, regulatory affairs kind of touches all aspects of the drug development process, all the way from planning and preclinical development through clinical trials, and then all the way until your drug is marketed and possibly post market studies. Um, and so, as a regulatory affairs specialist, um, you need to be aware of all of the different phases of how a drug might get approved in all of the different countries or health authorities that you're trying to get your drug approved in. Um, so we already mentioned the IND and NDA. Um, so obviously drugs are tested in human study or in human patients. Um, and so when you know you're thinking about your submitting your plan um, to a specific health authority, you need to make sure that, um, so a regulatory affairs specialist um, will make sure that the plan is um, accurate, safe, um, and appropriate for the specific health authority. Um, a couple points to um, highlight from this slide would be there's a lot of different meetings that a regulatory affairs specialist could request um, before a drug is actually marketed. Um, so the pre-IND meeting, so before a drug um, gets into humans, um, evaluating the clinical trial data from the non-toxicology um, study, the non-clinical toxicology study in animals, um, and making sure that we that we have the appropriate plan to submit to the health authority. And a phase two, that's very that's a very pivotal point, um, whether to move on into phase three clinical trials or kind of backtrack and reevaluate. A regulatory affairs specialist is definitely involved in that, um, and then also a pre-NDA or BLA meeting. So right before the drug could possibly get approved, um, making sure um, we have all of the documentation, all of the paperwork, um, and making sure that we, again, have the appropriate plan to submit to the health authority. Regulatory affairs crosses a lot of different functions, which is one of my favorite parts of um, being starting in this role. Um, so we're able to work with the, like I said, like the non-clinical statistics, um, more clinical development team to make sure that we understand the data. Um, we work with the safety and pharmacovigilance um, once the drug is marketed or even 
in the process of being marketed. Um, if any, you know, adverse effects come up, up um, you know, we make sure that that's, we have, again, that appropriate plan and we're addressing all the agency's needs, um, the health authorities needs going forward. Um, and then Medifair's commercial um, values outcome. So just a way to communicate the product to a specific group of people, whether that's the consumer, healthcare provider, like Nick was mentioning, um, you know, for, like national formulary um, management teams um, or any payers. Um, so it's really a neat role because we do get to work with a lot of different people, again, to get our drug approved in the most effective, most efficient way, in the safest way possible to a specific health authority. Um, so just some specific roles, like Nick mentioned, the liaison between the sponsor company and then a health authority. It's a very global role, which is what I like most about it. Um, your preparing and gathering all of the materials and being involved very early on from the IND. So right when it hits human trials, all the way through the NDA or BLA and the maintenance of the drug thereafter. So any annual reports, like we said, safety updates, um, any amendments or label expansions, you're involved in all of that through the lifetime um, of the product, which is super neat. Um, Anytime a global regulation changes um, or there's an update or a new one that comes out, you are the representative of the company that has to make sure that the company is adapting to those specific changes, um, whether that's manufacturing processes or safety updates um, to the label, you need to make sure that your company is within compliance wherever your drug happens to be filed or approved within that specific um, country. And then, like we said, the cross-functionality um, is very important and you need to be able to communicate and work with a lot of different people to, um, to hone in on everyone's skill set because everyone has the same end goal, get the drug approved and get the drug to as many patients as safely and effectively as possible. Um, it's just how we get there is um, sometimes a rocky road. So within regulatory affairs, there's a lot of different sub functions that you can specialize in. Um, and so there's the CMC, the chemistry manufacturing controls, and we'll go through these um, in a little bit more detail. Publishing operations, obviously it's a very international role. Um, regulatory intelligence, advertising and labeling um, and promotion. And so um, a lot of different companies can have you rotate through these different roles to find out where you best fit. Um, so you have the overarching umbrella of regulatory affairs. And then within regulatory, you can also um, specialize in a lot of different areas, which is pretty neat, I think. So product development, like I was saying before, taking the drug through the entire um, lifeline of the product. Um, so all the way from preclinical to clinical to post-marketing, you're actually preparing and gathering all of that the, the specific pieces that the um, health authority requires for their marketing applications. Um, and then you could possibly specialize in, you know, one or a few products or a specific disease state itself. So really it could get even narrower from just an overall um, regulatory affairs specialist. So CMC, chemistry manufacturing and controls, another subfunction of regulatory. Um, so this is a more technical role. And so people that work in this like to um, know how the product is physically made and physically manufactured. Um, so dealing with the lab, um, dealing with assays and other stuff that's way over my head. Um, so product release specifications, any manufacturing changes. Um, obviously we're in a world of biologics now. And so those are manufactured more those are more complicated um, to manufacture. And so having a regulatory specialist documenting that and submitting all of the proper applications to the healthcare authority is essential. It's required um, to get your drug approved. You deal a lot with the quality team um, to make sure that the you know, standards of your manufacturing facilities are up to um, good manufacturing standards. Um, and then communicate anytime uh, something changes within your manufacturing. Um, 
your manufacturing process, you need to communicate that effectively and accurately to the healthcare authority. Advertising, labeling, and promotion. This is personally the rotation that I'm in now at Vertex. I um, absolutely love it. And so um, you ensure that the, any promotional materials, any advertisements, TV commercials, brochures um, are appropriate for that specific audience. And um, when they're promotional in, in nature, kind of like what Nick was saying, um, they're accurate, they're not misleading. Um, we're making sure that there's data to support the claims that we're making. Um, so it's really once the drug is marketed and you need to advertise it to a specific population or a specific group of people, um, you need to make sure the regulatory affairs person needs to make sure that you're in compliance with the healthcare authorities uh, um, in their marketing, um, in their marketing products. Like in the in um, the U.S., we have direct to consumer advertising. So, you know, any any time the company directly advertises to patients, it's very important that there's strict regulations that you know we aren't misleading an entire population to mis to um, miscommunicate. Um, information about our drug. Um, so this is definitely a very important role for um, pharmacists and for regulatory affairs professionals. Yeah, these are just a few examples um, of what advertising and promotion looked out for. Um, so if you're looking at a TV commercial, if you're evaluating a clinical brochure, um, fair balance, so you always talk about benefit and risks. Um, you know, appropriate formatting, little things like you always have to have the brand and generic name together um, to not mislead people. And then, um, like I said, it's especially important within the US because we do, we are one of the few um, countries that have direct to consumer advertising. So again, we wanna make sure that we're accurately um, representing our company's product um, to the highest standard. Another subfunction, regulatory intelligence. So anytime there's a guidance change, anytime a healthcare authority um, or a health authority comes out with a new set of rules, a new set of guidances, um, the regulatory intelligence team is an internal team within the sponsor to make sure that um, anytime there is a change that's correctly and accurately brought back to the sponsor itself. Um, so if there is a change in the guidance or change in, um, the rules within um, or for a health authority that, um, you know, that that specific company is aware of the changes and following those rules and that there's steps um, in place. Um, so yeah, it's, you're an internal stakeholder, transfer the knowledge of the updated guidance document back to the company itself. And then regulatory international. So obviously every single country or every single health agency um, has different sets of rules and regulations. So you could be, as a regulatory affairs specialist, you could be located in that specific country and know those guidances like the back of your hand. Um, so we think of the FDA, we're located in the US. You know, you could have someone, you know, a group of regulatory specialists stationed in Japan working with um, their health authority and really understand their rules and regulations or Health Canada. Um, and so this is a really unique opportunity um, just to be in a global world um, and really understand and know the um, marketing application responsibilities for that specific country or that specific region. And regulatory publishing and operations. Um, so these are the people that are kind of manning the timelines. They're physically gathering all of the submissions. So you have to coordinate between a lot of different groups of people and you're physically submitting the um, applications or um, the filings to the specific health authority through whatever um, means that they prefer. So whether that's you know a secure portal um, or whether that's some other means, these are the people that are the operational side. So they're, you know, physically getting all of the application materials together from all of the different groups and submitting them to the, um, to the regulators. Awesome. Great job, Helen. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that overview. Um, 
I, it's very insightful. Uh, I, clearly, there's many different facets to regulatory affairs. So if you guys are interested, like definitely reach out. Um, you know, there, there's a lot to learn about this. Um, so now I've, there was a ton of information. I'm sure you guys have a bunch of, bunch of questions, but hopefully uh, I want to try and narrow the scope a little bit. So clearly you guys aren't going to have to do all of that or be experts by any means in any of that for the VIP case. Um, you know, I will say with this, there's probably a bit more of a strategic component to it. Um, as you're going to be overseeing the entire like development process of your team, um, you know, you're going to have to be liaising between different um, sub functions. So like, for example, with meta fairs and clinical development, you're going to have to like assess how your product works, what the best design of a clinical trial will be, ultimately reporting that to the FDA, which is the health authority um, and, and come up with the, the best design for, as I said, for the clinical trial. Um, I threw, so I'll, I'll run through, um, again, a, a little bit of what I was touching on regulatory affairs in general is a very cross-functional role. Uh, I, I just gave that example about, you know, meeting between clinical development and medical affairs, um, just to determine best pathways or designs for clinical trials. Um, you're even working with your marketing team. That's exactly what, um, you know, Helen's doing in, in her fellowship right now. So just making sure that any advertising or even like label claims, any of that is fair and balanced, uh, it has a equal, you know, uh, benefit and risk. Um, and then when you're actually, you know, developing these things, having a timeline is really critical in regulatory affairs. Um, you know, we're almost seen in, in sort of like a managerial role. Uh, we need to make sure that things are, um, you know, advancing, pretty steadily and rapidly as, as rapid as our teams can handle uh, just because we do, you know, we see the benefit that these drugs can have we, and we want to get it to market um, in a safe yet rapid manner. Um, and there's plenty of FDA guidances out there. You'll, you'll see if you Google pretty much anything next to FDA guidance, you'll find something. Um, so there's these guidance to industry documents, um, the FDA website has its own tab. You can search like keywords on there. Um, these will absolutely assist you along your journey. So definitely use them. Um, another thing that I've found value out, especially in, in my fellowship and, um, you know, a couple of people have even suggested doing this throughout my fellowship is this drugs at FDA. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to walk through this example, and it's a really cool resource, completely free to use, uh, available, available to the public, um, and it'll teach you guys a lot about the drug development process. So the first thing you do is just Google drugs at FDA, and it's like the first link that comes up, and you should come to a page just like this, and it'll give you a little search bar. Um, so I just typed in, I know that the drug that everyone is focused on is a, I believe, interleukin-5 inhibitor. Um, so, and that's for severe asthma, I think. So this is an already approved IL-5 for asthma. Um, so I type that in and you hit search. Next, you will, it'll likely uh, be under this products tab, but there's really only one product. So uh, just go ahead and click that product and you should be able to see um, the approval dates, history letters, labels, reviews for the BLA. Um, under this first section, go ahead and hit that review and it'll bring up this screen and it gives you a lot of information, but what you're particularly gonna be interested in is this multidiscipline review on the right. Um, it's a massive document, but essentially it just details exactly what the um, strategy was for getting this drug approved. And this is just like a small table in like this, I don't know, potentially like hundred page document. Um, but it, it highlights all of the meetings that they had with the FDA, uh, specifically surrounding some of the things that Helen talked about. So instead of like a pre-IND here, it's a pre-BLA just because it's a biologic and not like a small molecule. Um, they had various like a type B versus a type C meeting. Those are just different levels of uh, interaction that you have with the FDA. And it gives comments exactly, you know, what, what did they discuss in these meetings? Uh, you can see that they were discussing like the trial design, 
um, especially in that top one, they were talking about the protocol. So these are all like really critical things to, you know, a, a regulatory strategy a fellowship, but especially something to uh, apply to this VIP case. And I think this could definitely put your program above and beyond some of the others. Uh, if you actually like dive through this and see, okay, what was the design of their trials? Like how many phase two studies did they run? How many phase three studies? Uh, did they utilize like an accelerated approval pathway? Did they use like breakthrough therapy? Um, you know, all of these are like really big buzzwords that, um, you know, will, will definitely help you on your journey. You'll see them throughout the document. Um, so definitely like do a deep dive, not only on this, but if you want to look up other drugs too, um, you know, theoretically pretty much every drug approved in the U.S. should have some sort of documentation like this. And you'll see a lot of the health authorities comments about what they liked, what they didn't like, and what you guys potentially might be able to do in your own projects. So definitely check that out. Again, it's drugs at FDA, uh, really great resource. Um, and then Helen, do you wanna just discuss what makes someone a good candidate for reg affairs? Yeah, so just to sell you on regulatory even more, um, it's a really cool role. There's a lot of different areas that you can go into, which is super neat. It's changing all of the time. Um, so, you know, you're constantly learning, you're constantly growing in your professional field. Um, we all have strong clinical and science backgrounds because we are pharmacists. Again, like Nick said, we're keeping the patient in mind. Um, sometimes that can be a disconnect between the people that you're working with. So, you know, having a healthcare provider status, being a pharmacist who has seen firsthand um, the patients that are affected by our products and being true drug um, experts is super important to have as a foundation um, to go into regulatory affairs. And then leadership and communication skills. So it's all about those soft skills, um, able to collaborate effectively with other people, efficiently with other people. Um, obviously we're living in a virtual world right now. So um, being able to have that presence um, and have a seat at the table, have a regulatory affairs seat at the table along with your other um, peers and colleagues um, and able to be at those cross-functional meetings is super important to get the job done effectively and efficiently. And then project management skills. There's a lot of timelines. There's a lot of fast requests. Um, sometimes you're working on multiple projects and multiple um, disease states and, in all different phases of development. And so you need to be able to properly manage those um, projects and be able to just um, learn as much as possible. And then in conclusion, um, this is a super important role. Like we've been saying this whole time. I mean, you have to have regulations, you have to have guidances um, to get products approved um, safely and effectively. Um, pharmacists are, vastly involved within the drug development process. This is just one way, um, one pretty cool way that you can be involved in um, and hit a lot of different functional areas, work with a lot of different people on all different levels um, of um, seniority, of education, of you know spe um, specialization. So you really um, can you know, effectively um, do this job. Um, and I will say that um, I don't think you need concrete regulatory affairs skills before you enter into the field, you know, like throughout pharmacy school, um, you basically learn everything by doing and by experience. And so there's always different projects going on um, at all these different companies, like I said, in all different disease states and all different stages. Um, so it really is um, a fundamentally uh, excellent role for pharmacists to be involved in and um, definitely something that can be pursued after pharmacy school. Absolutely. Uh, I believe that's everything that we had. So we, um, we have some time for questions. Let me stop sharing. That's great. Thank you so much, Nick and Helen, for such a great presentation on what regulatory affairs is and how we can really use that other information for our VIP case competition this year. Uh, there's a few questions we have from the students att attending this webinar today. Uh, the first question is, 
do you have external meetings with other countries, uh, other countries' regulatory agencies uh, as well? Um, I, I can try and answer that. So, um, you know, I, I'm trying to think how I want to phrase this. Yes, I, I, I suppose that that's probably the, the quickest answer. Um, you know, if you work in a global company, and I think most um, either fellowship programs or pharma companies in general have some sort of global presence. So um, pretty frequently you're trying to not only get your drug approved in the US, but maybe in parallel, like trying to get it approved in different countries and have your submissions kind of line up around the same time. Um, there's very different regulations compared, like even just comparing the US to like the EU, vastly different, um, you know, arguably maybe even harder in the EU in, in many regards, um, just because again, some of their socialized medicine. Um, so you have to, you know, show different uh, benefit analyses, but yeah, there's, there's many meetings that are had with um, ex, you know, right, health authorities outside of the US. Um, yeah, and you usually like, have, yeah. Um, yeah, you usually have like, you know, um, a set of, you know, those local regulatory specialists that are working for your company mm -hmm. in that local country or in that local region. Um, so like, you know, Vertex is in Boston. We have an office in London who does all of the EU um, marketing applications and we're constantly working with them um, to get the drug approved. So there's definitely a global stage for regulatory affairs. Um, it's just whether you're directly involved in that or if you're more focused um, within the U.S. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to add a little comment for that. Uh, so I believe for the VIP case uh, competition, at least for this year, uh, the U.S. Um, approval is, I think, the main focus. Um, I think, Megan, you can also correct me. Um, but yeah, so, so I would just focus on the U.S. Uh, approval strategy. So mostly be the FDA, but it is good to think about other countries as well. Um, for our second question. Uh, I'm so gonna chime in real quick, Muaz, yeah, just ahead. real quick. Yeah, Muaz is very correct. So yeah, you guys definitely, when thinking about your case this year, definitely keep it US focused as far as like what you're gonna think as far as like your documents and that stuff. But I do encourage you that maybe if you wanna think about like the future of your project, you can definitely think if maybe you do wanna make it a global project and stuff like that and where your next steps might wanna be. But as far as, yeah, definitely for the focus of the case, definitely keep it US. Yeah, thank you. So our next question, uh, do regulatory affairs um, officials train other departments before marketing the drug? So I've had a, a little bit of experience with this. Um, so right before a drug hits the market, um, there's all of these tra internal training documents that um, the marketing team or the medical liaison team creates for their MSLs or for their sales reps um, to be able to go out and to advertise and to promote the drug to the different, um, you know, consumers or healthcare providers. Um, and so regulatory doesn't like directly train those people, but they review the materials that are used to train those people. So again, to make sure that there's a fair balance, that they're not only talking about the efficacy, they're also talking um, about the safety. Um, I, so I'm in advertising and promotion and, but one, one person on my team did say that she was on like set for a commercial um, to make sure that like the script was um, within like the FDA regulations. So I guess that could be like training people. Um, but basically we're just that internal check before the um, materials go out to be um, distributed to the healthcare professionals or consumers by the um, sales reps or MSLs. Perfect, thank you for that. The next question we have here is, could you explain the difference between a regulatory affairs fellowship and a global regulatory affairs fellowship, if there's a difference in that? I mean, to put it simply, I, th I think with regulatory affairs, you're probably just going to be mainly focused in the U.S. versus global. Um, you're going to be working not only in the U.S. but outside of the U.S. Um, for example, so I'm I'm in a global regulatory affairs fellowship, um, and I definitely have a mix. Um, personally, right now, I'm focused more on the U.S. Um, but I'm in weekly meetings with my colleagues, um, you know, over in the EU, 
Um, I'm trying to get more involved in the EU projects just so I can get a better understanding of the EMA regulations. So um, I don't know if Helen, is yours labeled as a global fellowship? Yeah, mine's global, like GRA, Global Regulatory yeah. Affairs, but my specific rotation, just US. Okay. Um, so I know my next couple of rotations, I'll be involved in more international projects. Um, but right now, yeah. probably just easiest to start and us off in, in the US. Yeah, and I, I think if you guys eventually like are, are seeking fellowships, sometimes they just don't always mention that they're a Global Regulatory Affairs Fellowship, even though like the company is global. So just you know, ask that along the way. Um, it's not always a given. All right, so our next question. Uh, can you give a few examples of what should be included um, as key messages for an IND package? This might be a good time to include Sean. <laughs> Sean, are you here? I am here. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. Okay. Um, so we're, we're also, we're lucky enough to be joined by Sean Harrison. He is one of my colleagues at, U at UCB. Um, he did a, a fellowship and, um, you know, has been working at UCB in our GRA program for a couple of years now. But Sean, I don't know if you want to give um, your own introduction and hopefully you can, I'm sure you can answer that better than I can. So Sure. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Nick. And thanks, Helen, and really everybody on this call. Um, really great presentation. Uh, like Nick said, my name is Sean Harrison. I'm a working industry pharmacist. I work with UCB, um, went through a fellowship and, um, you know, happy to be on here tonight. Regarding key messages for an IND, what you're really trying to establish here is that your drug is safe enough to enter those first in human clinical trials. So um, typically what you're going to be providing is your toxicology information with your, you know, the, all the toxicology studies that you've run. Um, typically there's two species that you'll run these in, a uh, uh, primate and non-human or a non-primate, um, like a rodent model to uh, establish like a um, LD50 sort of dose. Um, also your pharmacology studies that go along with it to show that there's a actual mechanism that goes along with your, with your drug. Um, a lot of times those can be tested in mouse models and it's good to have that sort of proof of concept before you actually launch in with the drug. Um, another thing you'll be providing with the IND is all the CMC information, the chemistry manufacturing controls um, to show that, you know, they, you've got a controlled process in place um, to produce the batches that you're going to be using in humans. Um, also with the IND, a big part of it is the uh, protocol and the study that you're going to be using to open the study. So with that initial IND, you're going to be submitting a protocol to say, you know, this is what we um, plan to run uh, in humans. And after you submit that, First IND, there's a 30-day waiting period um, just so FDA can evaluate your package to see, you know, are there any big safety concerns with what you provided in the toxicology information or any concerns for your first in human study, um, looking at the dose, the safety profile, that sort of thing. Um, and then after that 30 days, you should be good to go. You may or may not receive a study, you may proceed sort of letter from FDA, but um, by regulation after the 30 days, you can go ahead and get going with your study. Awesome. Thanks, Sean. Uh, yeah, much better than anything I probably could have provided there. <laughs> I appreciate it. No problem. Any other questions? We do have a few more questions here. Uh, all right, so the next question is, uh, they're asking, do both NDA and BLA have to be submitted together or is it just BLA for biologics products? So I guess you, could, you guys could explain the difference between NDA and a BLA. Helen, do you wanna take that one? 
I can try. <laughs> All right. I, I mean, I guess like my, my understanding is that they're two, you know, completely different applications and I'm, I'm pretty sure you would only submit the BLA, right, Sean? You, you wouldn't need an NDA for a biologic? So it, yeah, so BLA is biologics licensing application and an NDA is a new drug application. Typically for NDAs, these are small molecules. BLAs are for monoclonal antibodies, therapeutic proteins, um, you know, that sort of stuff. BLAs may be submitted to different divisions within the FDA. This might be getting a little bit um, too much of the minutia, but there's two uh, divisions that regulate um, like small molecules, which is CEDAR, um, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. And then there's also CBER, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. Um, interestingly, even though um, monoclonal antibodies are um, submitted as biologic licensing applications, BLAs, they're submitted to CDER. Um, so like blood products and stuff, vaccines, that's the type of stuff that would be submitted to CBER a lot of times. Um, so yeah, there, there are different applications. Um, I think this case is a monoclonal antibody. So you'd be looking at a BLA for your submission. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so I'm gonna, sorry, Muaz, I'm gonna cut you off again. <laughs> I'm gonna chime in real quick too, guys. The VIP case competition guide will also kind of help direct you with that. And then the great example that Nick walked you through too, if you look at the example on his slides, it'll actually list the BLA number on it. So that use that to kind of help guide you guys as well when you're thinking about this. Yeah, thank you, Megan. Uh, so the next question, uh, it's asking, um, I guess, which expedited tracks might be available for a product and how does the team determine which one they should use um, and when this decision is normally made? I believe this is actually one of our midpoint questions, or very similar to our midpoint questions. So please feel free to answer that. Um, so there, there's definitely several pathways you can utilize. Um, I'll admit I'm not entirely familiar with some of them, but one I have looked into is um, the accelerated approval pathway. Um, so there's a couple different ways that you can achieve that. There's three main criteria that you have to hit. Um, it has to be for a serious condition. Um, it has to be establish benefits over the current therapies available. Um, and then you have to demonstrate some sort of clinical effect that I, I can't think of the exact wording, but that's usually um, kind of an iffy one, especially with some programs I've looked into. Um, some ways to demonstrate this, you could either use uh, inter intermediate clinical endpoints. Um, so it's essentially like looking at your trial about halfway through, just, let's just say that. And if you notice that there are significant benefits, especially um, you know, assessing your primary endpoint, then you could go to the FDA and say, you know, is this acceptable? Um, do we have to actually complete the whole trial or can we kind of stop it in the middle and we'll do some post-marketing requirements uh, just to make sure that it's still safe, safe and effective. Um, so it's a faster way to get approved, but you probably have to show a sub like substantial benefit with your drug. Um, another one is using surrogate endpoints. So instead of a clinical endpoint, you can look at like biomarkers, for example. Um, so maybe this is like interleukin five levels. And if you can establish that if you're below, you know, or show like a certain reduction in those IL five levels that correlates with a good therapeutic response, you know, hopefully you can end the trial a little bit sooner, um, and, and go to FDA with that. So, um, John, are you, are you aware of any other, I know, I know there's like breakthrough designation, fast track. Yeah, so there, there's a whole guidance on there specific to expedited programs for serious conditions, which I'd recommend everybody look up. Nick's absolutely right. There is one for accelerated approval, which usually does go hand in hand with, um, you know, showing efficacy on the basis of a surrogate endpoint. And typically what follows that is, you know, you get approval early for your drug, maybe after a phase two study. Um, and keep in mind that these are for serious conditions where it's very important that there, um, you know, is some therapy because usually there's a huge gap. There's no 
you know, therapies on the market for it. But the, the real kicker is you do have these requirements and commitments after you get the approval to show efficacy in an actual phase three study. And sometimes it doesn't pan out. Sometimes, you know, you get approval based on, you know, the data that you provided, but your phase three trial ultimately shows that it doesn't have a real effect on a clinically significant endpoint. Um, so in that case, then the approval can get taken away. Other programs do include fast track designation, breakthrough designation, and I think priority approval is also lumped in there. Fast track designation and breakthrough can be applied for um, really at any time. Um, breakthrough does require that you do have clinical efficacy data um, in your compound, but fast track can be applied for on the basis of um, just really the theoretical benefit. Um, so like non-clinical models, mechanism of action. Um, and really what those are both really great for is increased interaction with the agency, especially breakthrough designation. But it's a very high bar because it's a huge commitment on both sides between the sponsor and the FDA to really push things through at a rapid pace. So working very closely hand in hand with the FDA to um, make sure that this important medication that you're developing is uh, really uh, seeing a, a rapid path through approval. Um, priority review is another one. So a typical review timeline for a BLA is 12 months if you include the um, initial review period uh, where they're just doing the um, check for the application to make sure it's complete. That usually takes about two months of the front end. Um, so like 10 months of an actual review. For priority review, um, this can be requested at the time that you submit your BLA, um, but this will drop the, the timeline from uh, 12 months to eight months. Um, so there's obviously huge advantages in that, but the, the criteria for all of these is in that guidance there. So I definitely recommend you check that out. Thank you, Sean. It's a great answer. Uh, the next question we have here is, uh, what are some ways to be involved in regulatory internationally other than being in a global company? Yeah, so I think that, I mean, if you're going into a fellowship, um, you know, it's definitely important if you want a more global role, if you want more international projects, you can um, voice that opinion during the interview process or, you know, with your hiring manager from the start. Um, you know, a fellowship is really neat in that they're always checking in on you and making sure that you're getting the most out of your fellowship program. So like just the other day, um, someone asked me which rotation I wanted to do next, what um, projects I wanted to work on, which disease state um, did I want um, to, you know, to work on. So um, just being an advocate for yourself is definitely um, important. And most companies have an international presence as well. So um, it shouldn't be that hard to get involved. Yeah, I, I definitely back that too. Um, definitely helps being at a global company, but even still like just try and leverage um, any connections that you can make. Um, especially, you know, you're, I, I'm assuming everyone here is, you know, kind of P1 through P4, make connections now. Um, I'm sure a lot of people that you're meeting are going to be interested in the industry, hopefully getting jobs at other companies. So, you know, for privacy and, and, you know, company secret type of stuff, like you, you can't always get involved with, um, detail oriented things within the company, but you can still learn about what they're doing. Maybe if they have, uh, if they're doing some sort of like research project um, about like EMA guidance or something, um, you know, keep those connections, definitely leverage those. Thank you both. Uh, so our next question is, uh, how should we use information of the drugs already on the market when figuring out interactions? I believe um, maybe drug interactions. I guess this question could be a little more general on like, how can you use information on drugs already on the market just to, I guess, solve the case? 
I, I mean, uh, exactly how I mentioned that drugs uh, FDA thing is like a, exactly what what you're looking for there. Um, it details the entire strategy of how it got approved. Um, it, it, there's a there's a ton of other information. That's just like one small subsection that I'm highlighting that's pertinent to regulatory, but they touch on pretty much every aspect of an application. Um, and not even just like BLAs, there's all these like supplemental or abbreviated applications that are usually put in there. So drugs at FDA, definitely. Yeah, I think that was the best advice you can give. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that is a re really good resource. Um, I mean, in regulatory affairs, you know, not just for this project, but in a real life setting, we do rely a lot on precedent um, when we're looking at the development of drugs. So these summary review documents are something that I actually use, um, maybe not day to day, but will refer to if I'm doing research on a competitor's product or something. Um, not only is it helpful to see what the companies did to develop their drug, but also how those regulatory interactions um, happened and what maybe some F insight into what FDA was thinking at the time they were reviewing the applications. Um, so it's, you know, you, you got to use whatever resources you can to get into the mind of the regulators. Um, you know, so, sometimes you don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, there's always room for innovation, but, you know, if there's a clear path laid out, um, you know, there's, there's it, the ro roads kind of pay for you. You just kind of got to walk down it, you know? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you. The next question we have here is, uh, do you know if map has a pediatric indication? And I was just, I was just looking at the Mepolizumab's uh, label and it is approved for patients aged 12 years and older. Um, so the question is, is there, is there another drug you would recommend to refer to when working on pediatric indication? And with the pediatric indication, uh, do, do, do we need to submit do we need to file an IPSP? So for the first part, um, I honestly don't know, but I think that's kind of up to you guys. I think that's kind of the, the purpose of the case is to go do your investigation, go see what drugs you can find uh, approved for asthma, or even it doesn't need to be specifically for asthma, but if it's a different like IL-5 inhibitor or just monoclonal antibody that was investigated in pediatrics, um, see what types of trials they ran. Um, it's probably going to be somewhat similar. Uh, maybe like the number of patients differs and obviously the endpoints will differ, but um, yeah, try, try and find a biologic that is approved in pediatrics. Um, I'll, I'll leave that to you. Um, the IPSP, I believe is correct. And Sean or Helen, I'm definitely going to need help on that, but because um, I, I feel like I've only heard more about the EU, which is the PIP, but I, I believe it's the PSP for the US, right? Yeah, that's correct. So this is really an interesting case um, because what you guys have been asked to do is get the pediatric approval as the initial approval. And I guess that could probably come at the same time as the adult approval. But that would mean that you would need to include pediatric patients in your phase three trial. So that means you need to discuss and agree to this with FDA at your end of phase two trial um, before you actually start that phase three trial. In the typical process of clinical development um, in the US, next right, you will be drafting a PSP or IPSP, which is your initial PSP. Um, typically, it's required 60 days after you have your end of phase two meeting. Um, so you probably will still need one because it will be required, but your plan for pediatric development will be to include it in the phase three trial. Um, I think that's a very important point that everybody on this um, webinar will benefit from because um, that might be a challenging aspect to this because typically uh, pediatric trials are deferred until after the adult development's done. Um, but, you know, something you'd probably be looking for in your early clin clinical studies is, um, you know, sufficient safety information 
and PK information to determine the dose as well in pediatrics, because remember, there's a, a lot of different dosing challenges when you get to the pediatric population. So I'll uh, kind of leave that out there as food for thought, but um, you know, pediatric development is crucial in this case. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, so the next question, again, it's, uh, I guess it's similar again for IPSP. Uh, so the team is asking, um, they want some clarification between the written request and the IPSP, and does the sponsor have to submit both? So there is a written request. These are really under two different regulations. Um, there's the Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act, BCPA, and then there's PREA. Um, PREA is kind of the stick, which is the regulation side, and the BCPA is kind of the carrot, which offers you incentives. The big thing with the BCPA is you get additional pediatric ex exclusivity for your drug if you do one of these written requests and complete all the clinical trials um, that come of it. It's something that's purely optional, so you can or cannot. That's you know part of your development plan, but IPSP is by regulation, so that's something that you will have to submit um, and would be discussed at the end of phase two meeting with FDA. Thank you, Sean. Uh, the next question is, are there standard checklists with deadlines used by the regulatory teams prior to communication with FDA? There's not like a checklist per se, but there is a shocker. There's a guidance document on this, um, you know, with, with any sort of communication. Um, I forget the name of it, but uh, it gives you like very good details about when um, the types of meetings that you can request with the FDA, um, the amount of time that it takes them to like accept that request and then schedule a meeting. Oftentimes you have to prepare a briefing package in order to have that meeting. So it gives you time like deadlines on when you need to submit that briefing package um, just to let them know like what you want to discuss with them. Um, so, I would look that up. Um, Helen or Sean, do you guys know that guidance document? I can try and look it up quick if, if we move on to the next. Not on hand. I, I, I mean, I think a lot of it's driven by, you know, what your specific objective is at any point in time. If you're asking what the requirements for INDs or BLAs are, those are out there and things that you can look up. But if you're at some other point in the process, it really depends on what your goal is, what questions you're asking, what information you need um, that really drives that checklist um, that I guess you can develop for yourself. All right, so our next question again about the IPSP. Um, so is that filed at the same time as the IND? No, the IPSP is typically required 60 days, I, I think it's 60 days after your end of phase two meeting. Um, so your IND would be filed to open your phase one study. You would have run your phase one study, run your phase two study. And then after your phase two study, you meet again with FDA having your end of phase two meeting. And then 60 days after that, your IPSP would be required. And there's an IPSP guidance as well. I know you're surprised. Yeah, if, if you guys have questions about anything, <laughs> definitely look up the guidance. I believe a link to the IPSP might be in the VIP PACE competition guide as well. We did try to give you guys some pediatric resources. So check that as well if you want to find that guidance, because I think it might be in there as well. Yeah, I, I really recommend that. I know Megan and the rest of the fellows went through a, a lot of time to compile some really, really good resources for everyone. So please check those out. I think the guidance was just published this year, um, or at least the updated guidance. So um, I'm not sure if we have the, the updated one, but um, we could definitely link to it after the meeting, if not. Definitely. Um, so the next question we have on here is, uh, do we have to write about BLA and not IND filing strategy? 
I, it seems like that's related to the VIP case because it says for number one. I'm assuming that's one of the questions. I don't know, Megan, if, if you have a little insight on that. Well, sorry, I, uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Sean. You might know better than I, but I believe you have to file the IND to then be set up to file your BLA. So you guys should technically have both included when you do the process, but Sean, you might be able to speak better to that than me. Yeah, exactly. Just process wise. So, so your IND, your investigational new drug application is what allows you to run your clinical studies. You can't run any clinical studies in the US without having your IND in place. Um, your BLA is your marketing application. So after you've run all your studies and said, hey, we've got all the evidence we need to show this drug is safe and effective in this population, at that point, and only at that point, would you submit your BLA. So I, I guess for the question, you will have both for, um, for your project. Yeah, so I just checked the question and it specifically asked for the IND filing strategy. Uh, the BLA is asked in question four. So I would just double check that. So yeah, so IND, it goes first. Um, so our final question, um, what can we assume the FDA response to the application's interactions be? Um, do we have to support the assumptions using examples from past drugs, aka approval um, from other pathways? Uh, I believe this question is just asking like, how do we prove um, that our responses to FDA are like realistic? I mean, I'm, I'm gonna say it again, drugs at FDA. Uh, you should be able to see what some of their responses were. I mean, obviously, like, you know, you, you guys are going to bring this through development. Ultimately, like, your drug's going to be approved. So you can assume that you're going to get positive feedback. Um, but, you know, don't, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I wouldn't say that, like, you know, you're going to have no adverse effects and, like, you know, this was effective in all patients. Like, make it realistic and look up, um, you know, while you're in drugs at FDA, see what trials they ran go into those studies like using PubMed or something and see like what were some of the adverse effects, especially with that drug I, I put on um, the IL-5 for asthma. Like see, I would use that as like a pretty good guide of what adverse effects were, um, you know, what was the efficacy, what endpoints did they look at? Like that should probably be your holy grail when you're going through drug development and then just take bits and pieces, like make it your own, be creative with it. There's definitely a lot of opportunity for that. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to add, Nick. Um, like, that's a great example, but don't be afraid to go to other indications to even like see how they conduct trials or their regulatory strategy and try to make it creative, you know, make your project stand out. And I think that was our last question. Um, Megan, do you have any final remarks? Um, I did just check the VIP case competition guide and we do have a link to the current guidance on the PSP. So if you guys are looking for that, it, there's a link for you in there if you want more information for that. Otherwise, that's all I have. All right, thank you everyone. This was successful. Cool. Yeah, if, if you guys have questions, I think there's, um, there's a link this year, right? To submit questions to for the VIP case. Cool. So yeah, I would definitely suggest um, putting them there. I'm sure Helen and I and, and Sean as well will be looped in on any of those questions. Um, and at least like personally, if you guys have questions about reg affairs in general, feel free to, to reach out. Um, I don't know if I, I think our emails were included, but um, or reach out on LinkedIn or something. O always happy to help out. Yep. Thank you guys for listening. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Helen and Nick, for such a great presentation and everybody else for making our Q&A session such a great one as well.